if you're in the mood for something interesting to use for decorating your living room, how about some dead animals? Uh, traditionally, we think of such decor to be found in like hunter's lodges on the walls um, full of uh, taxidermid mammal heads. But uh, one professor has taken her love for anatomy and her talent for art uh, to combine them into making you uh, take a new look at uh, the, the uh, art of the dead, if you will. Helen Cairo is an anatomy professor. She teaches human anatomy at various Bay Area colleges to pre-med and nursing students. Helen's background is in comparative anatomy, and when she's not teaching, she does science writing, conceptual art, and uh, skeletal and specimen preparation, which is uh, why she's here today. Helen, thank you for joining me today. It's good to have you here. Hi, Edgar. Uh, you know, thank you so much for uh, having me on. Um, uh, I'd love to talk to you more about my work. Yeah, no, it sounds like lots of fun. I'm always impressed when I see your stuff, um, not only with uh, how you did things, but uh, the artistic value of it. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about your work preparing specimens. Now, for people who don't know, you prepare dead, you know, dead things, and you you turn them into instead of just having them in a jar or something. You make things look very nice. Tell me about your work preparing specimens. Um, how did you get started in doing that, and uh, how did it evolve into the artistic skill that you now have uh, in the process? Well, um, it kind of started out in graduate school. Uh, I have a, um, a background in art and biology, so I did my undergrad in art, and then I did uh, my graduate work in uh, biology. Oh, really? So you're, you're actually educated and educated in, in art? Uh, yes, so I, I have a I have a BFA in illustration. So I um I I went to uh, my sort of um my first step, my undergraduate uh, schooling for uh, illustration, and then I worked in um, the gaming industry actually for about four to five years before going to um the uh get, getting my you know master's in biology. And um, the have always been really interested in biology. It was um sort of just a um you know just just getting, you know, working in the industry and getting some money for it and then uh, going to school again for it. And, um, you know, my, my work in biology w was based around anatomy. I'm real interested in comparative anatomy. And what comparative anatomy is, is sort of understanding how bodies are built and how they work. And the sort of mantra is form versus function. You know, seeing, you know, the, the form and the structure of how things are put together and inferring to their function. And, um, you know, I talk a lot about that in, uh, you know, my personal work, which is live streams and so on, you know, and, um, you know, and I think it's really fascinating how you can sort of see sort of exactly sort of how, how animals live, how they, they, they behave and, you know, their, their habitat sort of, and that's reflected in their anatomy, you know, how their bodies are structured. They're very, they're very perfectly built for, you know, the lives that they live. And, um, and that's, that's very interesting to me in terms of, um, you know, how it, how anatomy relates to the natural history of the animal and also how anatomy relates to other animals. You see um, sort of, it's, it's like, a, you, know, you know, like TV tropes, like you see the same, like, you know, sort of themes and a ton of different movies that um, in, that sort of propagate over various shows. You see that in anatomy too, where the um, similar themes and similar elements will propagate themselves over a number of different animal uh, taxa, over different species, over even different groups of animals, like mammals versus reptiles. And, um, you know, and sort of where these themes come from and where and what they mean and, uh, you know, why, why they're there is also really interesting to me in terms of, you know, most of it is evolutionary. It's based on the evolutionary history of um, these various vertebrate animals. That's great. So, so, I mean, so long story short, you're saying you, you ended up studying both. I thought maybe you went in to go ahead and do uh, uh, your biology work and then, um, and then art was maybe like a, a second thing, something you did on the side, but you were actually educated in it. So that's really interesting that you've combined the two uh, to create to create the things you do now. Um, I, I, when we when we when we do the video here, I'm going to go ahead and put some pictures up of some of your work so people will be able to see that. Um, okay. I've seen a lot of your non-dead art, 
<laughs> if you want to call it that, and it's impressive. Um, you're extremely talented. Um, you, wait, you mean the drawings? Yeah, yeah. Your non uh, biologic. Well, your non. Yeah, your drawings. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, yeah, I can I can probably provide more images of that. I would post that more, um, except a lot of my stuff right now is under NDA. Um, I have um, I mean, besides teaching and stuff, I also do like concept art for software and games and stuff like that. Yeah. So basically I can take my understanding of biology and apply it to like fantasy creatures. So I'm often called upon a lot to like design dragons or, you know, put like design creatures for like games and stuff like that. And also I'm um, working for a software educational software company right now where, you know, I'm sort of designing science lessons on how like sort of virtual dissections are going to be presented and so on. So uh, stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, there's, um, there, there's some like, you know, release restrictions for that. But, but yeah, I mean, I can, I can probably show you some more stuff. Yeah, no, it's great. I love your art. I love that you combine it with your knowledge of biology, uh, doing what you do. Now, um, mm -hmm. most people recall being in biology class, um, whether in high school or college, whatever, and seeing an array of pickled animals and mason jars that kind of line the classroom. And usually it's in like formalin or alcohol or something like that. But um, you do something pretty unique, and I've seen in some of your wet specimens, uh, your pickled preparations, if you will. Uh, it, in the process, it, it, it make, tell me about what you use to do that. In the process, it makes the body uh, of the specimen transparent, and it turns the uh, skeleton this beautiful purple color. So you have this beautiful skeleton seemingly floating in the jar, but actually the whole body is there. Talk to me about the process, what it's called, uh, the chemicals you use, and how you go about uh, creating those specimens. Okay, so so people always ask about that, and it's uh, fairly interesting. The process is called di diathanization, and it's, it's just like you said. It's a chemical process that renders the body of the animal clear and uh, makes the bones red. And whenever I show my um, diathanized stuff to people, they're always very surprised. They're like, you know, that's the first time that they've seen it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're, this is amazing. And they, they think it's a technique that I pioneered or something. And this is not true. This is a technique that's actually been around for hundreds of years. Um, it's, but it's primarily used in uh, things like science labs and, uh, you know, in sort of behind the scenes kind of technique. So you don't really or research lab. So you don't really see it. Um, one of the things that you, most people may come into contact with this process through getting a biopsy. So for example, if you ever, um, if you ever get a biopsy of like a weird growth or something, like if you have, um, you know, a tumor or something like yeah, that, taking they'll cut a sample, a piece off. Right? Yeah. And then they'll send it off to a lab. And what they'll do is that they'll use, a lot of times they'll use the same staining processes to dye the tissue and then pick out like cancer cells and stuff like that. Right. You see that, see that quite often. Um, but, but again, like most people in their daily lives won't see that. And that's one of the practical applications for it. Um, it's used a lot to study the skeletons of uh, animals. And um, it was, it was pioneered fairly early on. I believe it was like the 1800s. And um, it's based on the number of chemicals and they, they all have kind of interesting, interesting properties. So the, the chemical that renders the body clear is trypsin. So the process in and of itself is basically putting the, um, preparing the animal, you know, uh, and then putting it through a very, a series of chemical bath uh, at different temperatures and different length of time to get them to sort of end up that way. But um, the principal components are trypsin, alizarin red, and um, uh, uh, glycerin. So, um, Okay, so uh, trypsin is a digestive enzyme. In your in um, in your digestive tract, there's there's various enzymes that break down various things. So you so when you eat something, you know there's a stomach acid that you know breaks it up, and the the motion in the stomach that breaks up the uh, the food. But then there's a, to break down food chemically. There's various enzymes that specialize in different things. So there's an enzyme that breaks down plant tissue. There's an enzyme that breaks down connective tissue. There's an enzyme that breaks down like, um, sorry, oh, are you still on? Yeah, I'm, right. I'm listening. Oh, okay, sorry, they just um, cut off for a sec. Uh, so there's an enzyme that breaks down um, uh, proteins and muscle. That particular enzyme is called trypsin and it's made by the pancreas and uh, what it does is that when when you eat a piece of meat, it will it will break down all the proteins 
in the muscle and then only leave the connective tissue. Um, it, it's prescribed a lot for people with like digestive dysfunction, um, you know, for uh, sometimes people have problems digesting meat and um, so on. So, so, uh, I, so like a gastroenterologist sure, will sure. prescribe it to help. But anyway, so if you put the, uh, if you put the body of the animal in the trypsin solution at a, a certain temperature at a, like a close to a body temperature, what will happen is that you, it's kind of like bringing this digestion out of the body into like a jar. And what it does is that it, um, it breaks down all of the muscle tissue and it only leaves the, uh, the connective right. tissue. So it's a it, bit like digestion, but you, you almost eliminate some of the, uh, enzymes that would, uh, digest some of the other stuff you want to keep. Right. 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 Yeah. So, so then, so then when that's, um, when the, when, when that's over, all that's left is the connective tissue that sort of, that's sort of holding the, uh, the skeleton together. And you can still kind of see it. It's like a, it's like a milky kind of color, but, um, but, but most of the, the mass of the body is gone. And then you go into the, I mean, the next, uh, you know, you wash it out and, you know, there's some various like in between work, but um, that you then go into a lizard and the lizard bath. A lizard is a type of, uh, it's a type of food coloring, actually. It was um, extracted from the rose matter root, which is, uh, it's related to like beets. It's in the um, sort of right. root vegetable family. That's what gives the skeleton its color in the process. Yeah. So what's really interesting about um, a lizard is that it has a great affinity for calcium. It will, if you put something in a, in a solution of a lizard, the, uh, the particles of the dye will seek out any calcium in the solution and it'll bond to it. It sucks it up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and what's interesting is um, it, it was once used as a food coloring um, for things like red velvet cakes and stuff until people discovered that, you know, it was doing a lot of permanent staining in the, uh, the teeth and stuff. Oh. So it was, um, yeah, so, so the FDA decided that, you know, this was not good. And uh, so they've now rolled it back as a food coloring. You can still kind of, it's in small amounts, it's still available in um, some foods. Like if you look at the ingredient label for M&Ms, um, that still has a lizard in it. But um, Should I yeah, avoid so, the red ones then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't eat too many of the red ones. So, wow. So yeah. Um, so anyway, so it, yeah, so it bonds to, to calcium permanently and it'll seek out um, the bones in the animal and then bond to them so that, you know, the bones will turn red. This is also um, when you get a, uh, like a biopsy for a tumor, they'll use a lizard to stain the tissue because a lot of times tumor... Um, Tumor cells will have like a higher level of calcium than their surrounding cells. All right, so, so it draws that, that stuff into it and you can see it. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's what, yeah. So the, then they'll like look at the cells under a microscope and, you know, look, look at which ones are cancer. No, that's, so that's fascinating. That's a lot more complicated than I thought it would be. I mean, uh, when you usually, I usually just throw something in alcohol and that's the end of it, but I don't even have access to that stuff. <laughs> but so it's not only a chemical process, it's timed. It's formulaic and uh, and it's really interesting. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll put some pictures up while the audio goes on, so people can see what we're talking about. Um, okay. Now, in a recent Facebook post, you talked about the need to create more realistic or naturalistic wet specimens uh, rather than just dead things in jars, as you put it. Um, how do you make a dead animal that would otherwise just be floating in a jar look naturalistic? Um. It's just, that's one of those things I'm exploring. It's kind of uh, in exploration right now, and I don't know how long those specimens are going to last. But to me, I think from a teaching standpoint and, and to, to get people interested, it's really important that people can sort of look at specimens and not go, oh, dead stuff, you know, because anatomy in and of itself is really interesting. And, you know, look, understanding it is, you know, is, is it's, a, it's this really great story, but it's really hard to tell it because people are turned off by dead stuff and gore. People don't like gore either. So um, so there's always this constant struggle of like, how do you get people interested in this, but avoid the inevitable, like, you know, the death and gore. Yeah, so, you know, a dead thing gross. <laughs> yeah, and most people think it's, like, it's gross and, you know, that lends into like, is this smelly? Does this have bacteria in it? And that, like all, all, the, all those like other concerns that, you know, that um, uh, sort of get in the way of talking about anatomy. Sure. 
So, so yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that I've been trying to do is um, public education in sort of getting people who are not um, necessarily uh, like biology students or even students of science to sort of get take an interest in this stuff and you know develop at least a minimal understanding of it but you know developing interest in and of itself is very valuable because then people can go out and um you know start to sort of learn on their own but uh but yeah i mean looking at um looking at the different specimens that are available i i feel that it's it's really important to sort of get specimens that are sort of publicly digestible and i don't mean that literally i mean that like like anybody can look at it and be like oh this is cool rather than you know half the people being like oh god it's so terrifying you know that 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 kind of thing right right um, something cute yeah <laughs> and yeah yeah and even in um even in the research collections like if you if you go to uh like a museum if you're a scientist and you go to a museum and you want to study some sort of species of fish or something and um you want to take a look at their specimens Right now, the techniques that are out there um, are not, they're not great. Like if you, if you it's sort of like um, looking at wet specimens a lot of times from, if you, if you're in the know a little bit and you know, sort of uh, how to, how to parse out like the anatomy and any, everything, it's almost look, look like looking at a car accident. You have to be, all the organs are like different. Right. You know, and you not gotta the make, way they're supposed to be. And you gotta make Everything's sense of really all that. Shriveled. Yeah. Yeah, everything's really shriveled. It's like it's really so. So even if you're, even if you know about it, you you still have to parse it out, and that's uh, that's suboptimal. You gotta you gotta start off with a really good specimen. Yeah, but but wet specimens tend to not be very good after a while. Right, and that's a problem right. too. Yeah. All right, so you're experimenting experimenting with it, and so maybe you'll uh, hear pi- pioneer some new methods to uh, help those things look like they're living in there. <laughs> yeah hopefully <laughs> yeah um i know you do quite a bit of we're leaving the topic of wet specimens i know you do quite a bit of a skeleton articulation um mm-hmm. if for people listening that's uh where you basically strip down a dead animal to the bare bones literally and then arrange them in a static uh, naturalistic pose hopefully and i suspect that many people who uh, might listen to this would be interested in the process so tell me how you go from a dead animal to a clean white skeleton that's posed and looks really nice. How do you how do you how do you go about that? Well, um, I, okay, assuming that you already have the dead animal in your hands, um, I use flesh eating beetles. Um, they're they're called dermistid beetles, and they're a spe- there, there exists a species of insect that you can put the carcass in and then they'll eat up all the meat and leave the bone. It's kind of like, have you seen the mummy? You know, like, yeah, the, those there, there's a scene, yeah, there's a scene where the guy like falls over and there's like hundreds of insects crawl on him. And uh, when they leave, he's just bones. Yeah. It's sort of like that, except it takes a lot, a lot longer. Yeah. And, and they're also not as big. Isn't so. it the larva that actually do the work? It is the larva that actually do the work. Um, if you go to a museum, uh, a lot, most museums will have this. They'll have an exhibit called, you know, the flesh-eating beetle colony. Um, yeah, and, they, yeah, they'll call you know, them museum they'll, beetles, yeah. Yeah, they're called, and they'll, they'll, well, they'll, they'll say it's like, you know, museum beetles, or, or a lot of times they'll put flesh-eating beetles to make it sound more exciting. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> um, so, yeah, to get people interested, and you'll look in the case, and there it's like, there's like beetle beetle larva covering a skull or something. The, um, the, 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 the unexciting fact is that they're actually just carpet beetles. Um, they're not, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're like, there's, there's this sort of drive to like, be like, look at this. It's interesting. It's, it's like grotesque and fascinating, but really like dermistid beetles, like the, dermistidae, this, this entire group is the carpet beetle group. And what the, and you probably, you, you probably have carpet beetles in your house. I mean, they tend to they they're sort of united by their affinity for protein. They will eat things that are made out of protein. So this includes things like hair, um, uh, keratin, like toenail clippings, um, uh, things like glue, leather. Uh, they'll eat your shoes. This is the kind of thing that you see in closets that are eating leather jackets. So um, yeah. So and the reason that they the reason that they are uh, they're called carpet beetles is that in the uh, 
in the Victorian era, um, when these guys were sort of first uh, looked into and, you know, more serious research was done in them, they, you, you got to realize that in the Victorian era, all the carpets are, um, are wool and the curtain, curtains tend to be wool as well. And, you know, at, at that point in time, they also didn't have um, uh, refrigeration for food storage. So like, you know, pantries um, were full of like dried meats and stuff like that. And it, and back then they were much more of a problem than they are now. I mean, the, the invention of synthetic fiber has basically made them to not be as a problem. But, but yeah, so anyway, they, um, the, there's a number of different species and uh, they, they sort of specialize on various things. The one that's used, used in um, bone cleaning is um, Dermistus maculatus and it is, it's called the museum beetle. They have this characteristic white belly. So, so I know a lot of reptile people are going to be listening to the show, but they're not the same beetle that you see in the crickets. Um, okay. that, that by, they're, yeah, they're not the same species. That's that particular species, the, um, the black, that's the black carpet beetle and they feed only on keratin. Right. So, um, so you the, use the beetles to basically, I mean, you could get rid of most of the, uh, meat and skin yeah. as much as you can. But you use the uh, the beetles or the beetle larva to go ahead and uh, clean up that stuff that sticks to the bone, all the all the right. last bits of it, right? So right. there you go. You you stripped the skeleton. Um, it still doesn't look all that great. What do you do from there? Um, I okay. Well, the beetle lar- the beetles are really great just because the larvae are really s- start out very small, so they're able to get into a lot of the crevices, which makes um, yeah. which makes it you don't have to like reach in there to like in the gr- in the brain cavity the and all the little spots you can't get to. Yeah. So um, th- so after that, what you would do is you would degrease. You would try to pull the grease out of the skeleton. Um, depending on what the animal is, you know, this may or may not be necessary. Most. Um, most snakes or most reptiles are not very greasy, um, but most mammals are. And then you would uh, just whiten the skeleton in hydrogen peroxide. Hydro- um, a lot of people, when people start out, they tend to sort of go for the obvious option of using bleach. That's that's not good. Don't ever do that um, it, because that uh, will break down. It destroys. Down the it breaks bone. down the bone tissue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Does yeah, the- hydrogen peroxide is the same thing that they use to like whiten your teeth at the dentist and or bleach your hair and. That's it's it's a lot gentler on um, organic tissue. It also it also peters off in that like when you pour it out, the strength the uh, you get the full strength, and then because it degrades on its own via exposure to air and light, it it gets weaker and weaker. So it doesn't it, it just it, it becomes gentler as time goes on. And right. So so what do you soak it? Do you yeah. soak the skeleton for how long? Um, it depends on, uh, depends on the animal and depends on the degree of, uh, uh, staining, you know, some like for small fragile stuff, it could be as, you know, as low as 20 minutes for, um, things that are heavily stained. I've, you know, I, I've had things where I've soaked it for weeks. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just, yeah, it, it just depends on what it is. But um, yeah, but yeah, hydrogen peroxide is what you want to use. All right, so you've stripped the you stripped the you stripped the dead thing of all you could. The beetles have taken care of the uh, leftovers, and you've mm-hmm. degreased it, and uh, you've uh, you've soaked it in hydrogen peroxide to get a nice white skeleton. Mm-hmm. How do you po- I, how do you uh, pose it? Yeah, and then and then I, I generally just I, I glue it together and I put it in a frame. I mean, I um, you know, I, I don't start out with like just doing this stuff. But like, by the time that I've started, I already have a um, sort of idea of what, what I'm going to, to do, like, what, how, like how it's going to sit in the frame and what it's going to look like, you know, and that's, I, I already have that. So I could, so I could just sort of pose it to the, the original plan and, uh, and just put it in. Oh, that's very good. Now, mm-hmm. uh, while people that might be listening, uh, they, they, they might be thinking, Hey, this is kind of fun. Uh, they might get excited to uh, take up uh, specimen preparation as a hobby. Um, it's important that they understand that there's many laws preventing you from even owning certain uh, certain species, certain animals, or you know, even just going out and picking them up off the off the road. You know, uh, talk yeah. a little bit about where people can find out uh, animals that they shouldn't be you know messing with, um, or otherwise is it, is it a whole process of research uh, depending on what you're going to work with. 
So um, laws are really important. Um, you know, there's the, depending on where you are in the country and where you are in the world, there's various laws that need to be followed on things like possession and, um, you know, and which animals can be kept, which animals can be sold and so on. I would suggest that a person starting out just get normal things, um, things like that's from the pet store. Um, Your neighbor's uh, cat. Things that, yeah, things from the well, I mean, not, well, I could possibly the neighbor's cat, but um, died yeah, naturally so, on your so lawn. I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because, like, when people want to start out, they're they're they usually start out with let's collect roadkill. That's like interesting and fun. Yes. Um. Yeah. Most people want to start doing that, but the thing is, like, um, it, it's not really good to do that. Well, first of all, from a legality standpoint, um, roadkill collection is illegal in most of America. Yeah. Even in places that are legal, that that it is actually legal. Um, you need a you need some kind of permit, or you need to actually report your find, or something like that. And they do that because um, sometimes people have people have this problem with like poaching. Like the, they'll 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 kill like you know they'll shoot a deer off season and insist that it's roadkill or stuff like that, which which has basically ruined it for everybody. So so in in most states in the U.S., you can't. It's illegal to collect roadkill. And, you know, you would want to, oh, sorry, and, and you would want to find out, you know, you, the laws that pertain to your state in states where it is legal um, and is sometimes encouraged, like Alaska and um, things like West Virginia, you, you would need to either have a permit beforehand or you would need to collect the animal and then, then report it. So there's, there's some procedures that do need to be followed there. But the main thing is that um, I, I don't think people, you know, I, when I started out, I was in West Virginia and I was picking up roadkill, but I mean, it's not, it's not really great. Like, like I, I'm going to say this and you're going to laugh, but like collecting roadkill is not really what like people say it is. It's, it's not what it's all cut out to be. Like, it's really overrated. It's delicious um, in Louisiana. Yeah. The, the thing with roadkill is um, you, you're not, it's really hard to get any useful bone because like, if you think about it, if an animal gets hit on the road, um, if it's even a little, if it's injured or if it's even got a little bit of life left in it, it's going to crawl off into like a brush or a culvert or something and die in there. But if, but if it's hit hard enough to, to kill it instantly and leave it lying on the side of the road, those are some very major injuries. Oh, it did and, some um, damage to the bones anyway. Yeah, so most of, so so you're you're talking about like large scale shattering injuries that um, you know makes it not really worth your time to do. Like I think I would say that probably ninety percent of roadkill will have a shattered skull. Um, the other the other 10% is injuries to like the upper rib cage and the heart. Like you don't even see too many lung injuries because those animals will crawl off somewhere and die. So generally, like when you see roadkill on the side of the highway, um, they, like, especially if the speed limit is anywhere above 40 or something, usually like they're, they're just, they're, they're bags of mush, you know, they're, <laughs> not yeah, the, there's, not there's the no the point cleaning them. Right, right. So yeah, I so mean, stay away from roadkill. Um, and I would, I would, I would think people that uh, want to know if they're even allowed to take a certain animal uh, probably should just check into the local wildlife laws. If you're not allowed to yeah. hunt it or keep it in the first place, you're probably not allowed to have it dead for any reason. So it takes some research. Good, uh, good way to do that would probably be check out the local yeah. wildlife laws and stuff like that. Um, and don't go hitting stuff with your car. Yeah, the um, I'm glad you mentioned that because possess, uh, possession laws are different for um, for live versus dead animals. There's tons of animals where you can't have a live, but you can totally have them dead, and vice versa. Yeah, um, just just off the bat, <laughs> it's a matter like how most, you got it. Yeah, how you got just, it just, dead. Yeah, just off the bat, most birds are illegal. Um, uh, and we're talking about native birds. Most There's wild a law birds, the, yeah, yeah, the migratory. Um, uh, Migratory Bird Act that yeah. makes most birds illegal. Um, most marine mammals are illegal, um, and I would say native animals are, mo are legal in some states and not yeah. not legal in others. But I think predatory like, mammals. Yeah, for people starting out, um, I would suggest going to 
uh, sources like grocery stores, honestly, you know, uh, farms, grocery stores, um, pet stores, animal breeders, you know, there's tons of sources um, for animal carcasses and bones and stuff like that, that are just, that are just out there and anybody can take advantage of. Like I get a huge proportion of my stuff from grocery stores, like seriously. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, really like goat skulls and, uh, you know, pig skulls and stuff like that. Just, just from, yeah, just from stores. Right. And often it's, you know, free or cheap because nobody eats them. So you can talk to farmers or animal breeders that, uh, deal with, uh, like livestock, stuff like that, stuff that's yeah. uh, commonly kept and you don't have to worry about it, it being illegal. No, that's really right. interesting. Something to look out for. Make sure you don't get in trouble if you decide to get into the uh, specimen preparation uh, or skeletal mm -hmm. articulation. You want to prepare wet skeleton, uh, wet specimens, whatever you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any uh, big projects you're working on, or or would like to work on? What's something you'd really like to do? Um, I would like to incorporate motion into skeletons. So one of the things wow. that you know I'm very fascinated with is um, how muscle interacts with. Uh, with with bone and with the skeleton to make the animal move. So I'm, I mean, besides looking into better ways to present specimens and better ways to sort of make them, I'm also looking into seeing if, if it's possible to articulate them in a way to have natural motion. Um, the other thing is that to, the other thing is that I want to look into um, ways of presenting how uh, bones themselves interact and how they move in terms of um in terms of the way that they're joined like for example like when you look at a human skull like you have the skull and you have the lower jaw right so and that's kind of the only part that moves but that's not tr that's true for most mammals but that's not true for reptiles for reptile skulls um if you've ever seen a snake eat something they they, they have tons of bones that sort of interact together to be able to manipulate the food in different ways so it's, it's almost like, like a hand where they have all these tons of moving parts, but when you put the skull together, you can't really show that anymore. I mean, it's just the skull. You, it's, it's difficult to appreciate that all these parts move in the, uh, independently. So, so one of the things that I'm looking into is um, how to articulate these things so that, you know, you can still show um, how the, the parts interact with each other. So those, those are just some various initiatives. I mean, I, I, I do various projects here and there and, you know, and sometimes, you know, there's other ideas that come up and so on. That's great. So now, not, not too, now not too you pique people's interest. You have these beautiful specimens that you prepare. Um, it's something you don't have to feed. <laughs> you don't have to <laughs> feed it. You don't have to water it. You don't got to walk it. You don't got to worry about it dying because we're there already, right? Now, people might be interested in uh, getting started in preparing uh, dead specimens, uh, whether it's with the skeletons or any other way. Uh, how do they get started? What do they do? I mean, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, domes uh, domestic uh, what, goats, cows, stuff like that, <laughs> or um, things that are legal, but um, where can they learn more about, uh, about doing this? I, honestly, you know, nobody ever taught me anything. I mean, I think like trial I, I and think error. the best teachers, huh? Trial, error, and uh, your own research. Yeah, trial and error. Like, you know, trial and error is literally the best teacher. You know, when I was in school, I just I bought a uh, colony of um, dermistic beetles off eBay. Uh, they're, they're sellers on eBay. I mean, and I would suggest people buy off eBay just because, like, you have a, you have a quality guarantee. Like, if, they're, if they all arrive dead, you can get Right, you know, or they can get it from get you. New ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... So yeah, I just bought them off eBay and um, I started doing it. I, for about a year, I ruined a lot of stuff, but I mean, because I was so new, I didn't even realize I was ruining stuff. I was just like, oh, right. I got bones. It came out. It's awesome. But I mean, nowadays when I look at it, I'm like, oh my God, I ruined that nice specimen. But <laughs> like, you, you know, you, you just kind of learn as you go. And, you know, it's not hard to pick up. There's, there's all these like forums that are dedicated to, uh, like uh, like Facebook groups and stuff that are just dedicated to you know different ways of doing things, but honestly, it's it's like it's like your reptile community thing. It's like um, you know people somebody will be like you know bioactive substrate is the way to go. Other people are like newspaper you monster you know you're, you're Nazi for doing that or something. But like honestly, like 
you know, you just, you just, just do it and you'll work out your own way. So like, if you, if you get caught up in discussing things like optimal temperature and humidity and stuff like that, you'll never get started. So, I mean, and you might, you might run into things like you might have something wrong. You might run and have mites or something like that, but it really like the best teacher is just experience. Like I would, if for somebody who just wants to get started, I would get started. And then if you have a problem, maybe ask all online. I wouldn't, you know, sit online for, you know, years just to like accumulate, like accumulate right. knowledge. Because sure. Seek out, seek out thing. others doing it. Huh? Seek out others doing it. You can learn from them too. And, yeah, uh, I mean, you you could do that, but like I would, you, I would you encourage to people to it. take their own journey in the process, see what works with trial and error. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's best to just get started. I mean, there's no there's that's no right. other teacher like trial and error that's so effective. Yeah, stop talking about it and do it, and it helps if you have a detached building <laughs> in your home at your home. Um, well, okay, you can actually people think it's really smelly and that's kind of a novice thing. Um, I've had a colony in my apartment for like the last number of years. And the thing is, if you keep everything dry, um, it's, it, it helps the smell substantially. So basically if you dry, if you dry everything like jerky and put it in, it's, you know, it's really going to reduce smell. A lot of the smell is, a lot of the smell is from bacteria can't build up. Yeah. Bacteria, but also like, things in the substrate, like, um, like mold growth. Um, that's, that's bad. So, so yeah, I mean, if you can control like moisture it's really going to, to, you know, help substantially. I mean, again, that's one, that's one of those experience things too, you know? Yeah. No, that's very good. No, Helen, I appreciate you talking with me today. Where can people interested in, uh, your preparation, where can they get some of the stuff you're making? Um, and how can they get a hold of you and where can they see more? Um, I, uh, okay. So I post a lot of my stuff on webs uh, on my, um, on my Facebook. Uh, it's a anatomica, a, a, n a t o m i c a. So there's like a two A's in the front. Um, uh, ours anatomica on Instagram. Um, there's ours anatomica on Tumblr. I have a, you know, series of blogs and stuff like that. Uh, and also anatomica.science is, um, a sort of a website where I post uh, a lot of, um, you know, the finished pieces and uh, so people can take a look. Um, in terms of buying things, I, I sell things sporadically. I have an Etsy store that sells, you know, smaller things. Um, it's called Lithographica. But for the most part, I, I do a lot of like, I do a lot of custom pieces. Um, you know, I have some larger things that go up for sale here and there. And, uh, you know, I typically announce them if they go up for sale. So yeah, larger skeletons. No, very good. We'll pull all that. We'll put all that information up on the screen so people can see it. And, uh, maybe we'll put it up the whole time so people uh, can check it out while they listen to you. That was, uh, that was great. Helen, no, that was really interesting. I appreciate you talking with us here today. And, uh, I hope we can, uh, I can have you back here sometime and, uh, we'll talk about something else and I'll see you at the Reptile shows or wherever you are. And, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, right. Thank you so much right, for having me on. I appreciate it. That was great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.